Hi, this is Scott Garibay. Today we're going to talk about Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, and we're going to talk about The Legends of Vox Machina, Amazon Prime, Season 1, Episode 4. I'm going to tell you the best thing in the episode, and I'm going to tell you the worst thing in the episode, specifically from the perspective of Dungeons & Dragons. All right, uh, so let's jump into it. All right, so um, so what does it mean from the perspective of Dungeons & Dragons? Well, it means that every single thing that Percival does can't count, right? Like, because you don't have gunslingers in Dungeons and & Dragons, and Talos and Jaffe's character choices, player character choices, you know, uh, detract from Vox Machina being a good Dungeons & Dragons story, even though the engine of Vox Machina is Dungeons & Dragons, right? So, like, and then you have, like, um, what's a good example? Uh, Vex, um, you know, so Laura Bailey's character is a very, you know, her race is Dungeons and Dragons, her class is Dungeons and Dragons, her equipment is Dungeons and Dragons, right? So she's eligible, right? Like, all right, <coughs> excuse me. So what is the best thing in episode four? So first of all, this is a very difficult list because there's a lot of amazing things in episode four. I am absolutely delighted with the new three, um, three episodes that dropped. Uh, so this was a tough to say, this is the best and this is the worst. But here's the best, okay? The best thing in it is Grog working out, right? So, um, oh, by the way, spoilers for for season, uh, spoilers for Vo- Legends of Vox Machina on Amazon Prime. All right, so um, so Grog working out, right? So, so basically, um, Vox Machina is given by Sovereign Uriel, the king of Talidore. Uh, he uses the title Sovereign, but it's functionally he's a king, right? It um, is really, really uh, fun, and it was just kind of crazy where... So, oh yeah. So, basically, he imprisons them in their keep, right? Which was given to them as payment for defeating the dragon in episode two, okay? Um, but when they're put in prison, they don't have anything to do. They're very bored. They're locked up in a room, right? And um, and Grog just takes two barrels, straps them to uh, you know to uh, um, like a pine board, and is lifting them, right? And I was like, and the reason why I love this is this was brilliant. I thought this was absolutely fantastic because it's the kind of thing people don't think about with their player character. They don't like, I'm going to go over and practice my sword. But the reality is adventurers would absolutely need to do a lot of practicing and they would need to really be on point for, um, for these kind of things. I love the show house. I'm not sure if any of you have seen that, but one of my favorite shows that that's a show about a doctor. You know what they did? They would show him constantly reading books and I was like, it's so realistic. And so this was one of those house reading a book moments in Vox Machina is just Grog is like this barbarian, but he takes time to work out. He's like, hey, when I hit a dragon, I want that dragon to feel it, right? Like, I, I loved it. It was just so good, right? What was the worst thing in uh, season one, episode four of Legends of Vox Machina? I'll tell you what it was. Okay, there's a moment where Pike Trickfoot and Keyleth, um, the whole group is in the keep and they're in the dark, right? And they need, they specifically need to cast light, right? And, um, and so that they can see, right? And neither Keyleth nor Vox can cast light. And I was like, uh, no, this does not work. It is nothing more than a very bad writing uh, it's a writing fumble. Like, it's just a writing fumble. And the reason why is you're asking us to believe that this team who has not a single caster that can cast light, which is, I think it's a cantrip spell. It's either cantrip or level one, depending on where you're at. But here you have a druid and you have um, a cleric and neither one of them can cast light. But so, so one, there's so many problems here, right? Um, the one, the biggest problem is it can't, they can't cast light, right? Um, but you're telling us that they defeated a dragon. I can tell you right now, if you got a group with two casters that can't cast light, 
you are not going to be defeating a dragon with that crew, right? The other thing is uh, overlapping stories. These, oh my God. Mercer is just, he has seven people on his back. Like, these players are so bad. Like, at just doing functionally, like, simple things, right? So one, if you're a player, like, don't tell the same player story with different characters, right? And both Keyleth and Pike Trickfoot are like, we suck. We're really not good at this. We're timid and don't know who we are and don't know why we're here and can't control our powers and we really need you to understand that we just suck, right? Like, and I'm like, why would, why would, okay. First of all, I don't think any player character should have this, right? Like, cause you're like, uh, people who don't have confidence don't go slay dragons, right? Like, that just doesn't happen, right? Like, you don't go out in the world and adventure if you think you fundamentally suck, right? Like, so, like, these were incredibly poorly crafted characters. And again, I, I get why, because the reality is, is like, they never thought, you know, we're going to create the best Dungeons & Dragons streamed game in the world, right? They just were friends with Mercer, and they were, and I'm just shocked at seeing how hard Mercer works, that none of them ever were like, maybe we should get together and, like, start to take our character ideas in different paths. Maybe we should not both play timid, sucky adventures, right? Like, and you're like, why are you doing this? Are you like, it's just, it just, it overlaps and it's bad. <laughs> it's just really bad, right? And because it, it's duplicative and it was on them, right? It was on Marisha Ray and it was on Ashley Johnson to take their characters in non-duplicative paths and they didn't do it, right? Because, and it, it led to this, you know, this world in which you have, where you're asking us as viewers to believe that these two help take down a dragon, but neither of them can cast light, right? Like, I'm like, you know, this does not work, right? This is like, oh, right? So it was just a very dramatic writing failure, right? Now, I'm, I'm telling you the best and the worst. Why am I telling you the best and the worst of this? I'm a parent, right? And I've learned a long time ago. Like, um, when my kids come home, if I ask them, hey, how was school? They'll say fine, and the conversation's over. Uh, so I've crafted these questions that draw out, like, the, that draw out the extremities, right? Like, so I'm like, did anyone get wounded today or cry at school? Right? Like, and you will be amazed how often... Like, uh, you know, well, I, there's almost never the wound part, but crying is like, or I'll craft it, you know, into another, into another, like just really specific, like, did this weird thing happen? Or that's another one I'll say is what is the weirdest thing that happened at school today? All right. So I'm picking the best and the worst because those are extremities and those are what are most interesting. I went, really went off on the worst part, Right. But I am loving this show, right? It is dramatically good. And I am just wonderfully, wonderfully delighted to have the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon back, right? Gygax gave it to me in 1983, and I had it until 1986. Mercer gave it to me in 2022. And I think this thing is much more well-crafted and um, more thought out and more possible that it will be a absolutely juggernaut success, right? So I'm very excited for this. It, and I, I blasted through uh, all three episodes and absolutely loved it. Um, have you seen episode four? What did you think? What do you think was the best thing in episode four? And what do you think was the worst thing in episode four? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, I'd really love to hear what you're thinking of Legends of Vox Machina. I, honestly, I have to say, this thing has 100% won me over. I'm really down. And I think I'm delighted because I'm really, I, you know, I tried to watch Legends of Vox Machina. I'm like, are you kidding me? I watched four hours of this and it's like 30 minutes of game time. It's so like, I just could not watch Legends of Vox Machina web, right? But this animated show moves very quickly, and I'm learning the characters, and I'm loving the story, and the action is amazing. But, so, all that, is, it's functioning like a regular show where it's just, you know, stones to the wall awesome, right? 
And, um, but more than that, I'm just thrilled with the concept that this is sitting in a muggle zone. This is Dungeons and Dragons in a muggle zone, right? Now here, let me give you an example, right? Reacher just dropped, okay? Jack Reacher. It's like a bog standard, like, men's action hero, right? And, uh, by the way, Tom Cruise played Reacher, and... Uh, he, and people were like, well, that was an okay movie, but, like, Reacher's, like, 6'4". I don't think, uh, he is, I don't think Tom Cruise is 5'4". So, the reality is, like, uh, I just love the idea that Reacher fans are gonna watch Vox Machina. 99% of them won't, but there are gonna be 5 million viewers! That's not an exaggeration of Reacher, and that means that 50,000, right, We'll jump over and watch an episode. And I'm just so excited that 1% of Reacher's audience could discover Dungeons and Dragons. It's brilliant. And we owe it all to Matthew Mercer. Uh, he really has accomplished an incredible amount. All that's my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts again on Legends of Vox Machina. Let me know in the comments below. Please consider like subscribing and have a wonderful millennium.